Well, thanks very much, Kalen, and uh, I just want to first start off by where I have the chance to work. I have the privilege not only to look after patients, but work at two institutes that work in tandem overlooking the 10th hole of the south course of uh, Torrey Pines. We cover the T. De Green Translational Science Institute and the Wireless Health Institute. And we're in a great place in San Diego because it not only carries uh, 50 research institutes, but it has 600 life science institutes, and it's the capital of wireless, and there's a high density of both wireless and information technology companies here. So with that background, and that we live in a digital world, of course, uh, one with billions of billions of bytes and screens and streams and clouds and crowds, but it hasn't gotten to medicine in any significant way yet. But the last decade has been transformational in that regard and has changed in so many ways by digital mobile devices such as the iPod, the Crackberry, Ra Blackberry, the uh, iPhones, and e-readers. <coughs> Cumulatively, in seven years, these all came about, and they changed the way we not just listen to music, the way we read and the way we communicate, but the way we think and the way we behave. So much to the point that now not even having any one of these devices or screens uh, by itself is adequate for us. In fact, we live in a world with multiple screens, homo distractus. <laughs> and it's occurring at earlier and earlier ages. Uh, take this example. OMG, I just got born. <laughs> now, very simple quiz question. What went from zero in 2004 to what will be 550 million in 2010? Facebook, right. And what went uh, from zero in 2006 to 100 million a day in 2010? Twitter. So these social media have changed things. And why am I talking about medicine and bringing up social media? And that's because of, of example, this article that appeared in Science uh, just a few weeks ago, essentially, from MIT. And it was about the spread of health behavior on a social network. People were randomized to a dense, uh, highly clustered social network to one that was very loosely associated. And what was found is that people would change their health behavior as assessed through the web very quickly and profoundly if they were with a dense, a clustered social network. And these networks, these open platform wiki communities, you're familiar with many of them, like Wikipedia, but now they're starting to blossom in the medical community, like patients like me uh, and many others. And so this is a good thing. This is another part of the digital medicine frontier of the future. Now, to look at the technologies uh, as we uh, go from the cell phone in 1973 to the personal computer uh, just a couple years later to the internet 15 years ago, digital devices uh, in the last decade, and then sequencing, which is really accelerating right now, which we'll talk about in a moment, social networks. This has led us to a very remarkable uh, time, the great inflection of medicine. So right now when we see patients, we see them and talk to them for a short time, and we assess them for that moment. We may check a cardiogram. We may check a blood glucose or a blood pressure. That's all a one-off, one snapshot in time. Hardly any panoramic uh, important view of that individual. But that's going to change, because now with life codes, the six billion bases of the human genome, we now have a time when we can drill down on any individual's biology. So first we had GWAS in the last three to four years, genome-wide association studies. That was a peek into the genome, and that was just looking at one, one million bases. But now we're in a very rapid uh, time of WGS, that's whole genome sequencing, able to sequence virtually every base of the human diploid genome, which is six billion. But what we have learned from just the peak of a million bases into the human genome has been extraordinary. And this is a schematic of the 23 chromosomes about complex diseases, diseases in which there are many genes that have a role and there's a gene-environment interaction. And in 2005, only one of these had been discovered through GWAS techniques. And watch what happened over time, 2006, and then we go through quarters of 2007, 2008, and 2009, and finally in 2010 we have now already 165 diseases cracked as to where in the genome, what genes are responsible. And so what we can say is in the last three to four years, more discoveries about the root causes of disease 
that has, have been made than in the history of man. While that hasn't affected us on a day-to-day -day life uh, as far as preserving health or preventing diseases, it's a great start. But there is one area that is ready for prime time, and it isn't being used, unfortunately, yet by the medical community in daily practice. Pharmacogenomics, which really has legs. The number two prescription drug in the world is Plavitz. It's used predominantly to prevent blood clots in patients who had a stent placed. This medicine now accounts for $9 billion of sales per year, of a $300 billion U.S. budget in pharmaceutical drugs per year. Now, this is uh, a Manhattan plot of the genome, looking at a million markers, and it's looking for a skyscraper. What explains the plavic response? And you can see one, and it's the gene that is responsible for converting plavix, which is, which is an inactive drug, into an active drug. And in order for that to occur, it turns out that so many people don't have the, the normal gene, the wild-type gene. In fact, at least a third, or over 50% of people of Asian ancestry, carry at least one allele that can't allow metabolism of plavix. The, the drug isn't working in those people. They have three times the risk of clotting off their stent. If they do clot their stent, they either die or have a heart attack. And we can check the platelet function to make sure it's working, or if the genes are really operating uh, as predicted from a genotype, by point-of-care platelet testing. Very simple and relatively inexpensive. And there's actionable information, because we can change the drug that we give the individual and this is just an example, using more of the standard drug or new alternative drugs that have been uh, uh, developed and approved. This is a prototype of pharmacogenomics today, but it isn't used in many centers, uh, and it needs to be. Uh, now, let me show you one other example, which I think is really exquisite, and this is about malignant melanoma, which is usually fatal within one year. But now, we recognize that two-thirds of people with this disease, this cancer, have a specific mutation called BRAF. And a drug has been designed specific to this mutated BRAF. And you see here are PET scans, and there's melting of the tumor, 81% of the people, in two weeks of an oral therapy, because it's so specifically designed for this driver mutation, have a remission of their disease. And in fact, what's really fascinating is the people who don't have the mutation, who get this drug, actually get worse. This is a, a, the exemplar of individualized medicine. Now, I wasn't going to be Dr. Gizmodo today, but let me take you to the wireless side of medicine, because that's also very exciting. I can now follow patients in a hospital anywhere in the world on the Internet in real time. And it's very simple. This is a device that I'm looking at right in my iPhone. And in real time, I can just look at patients and see how they're doing. And we'll just pick one of these patients and show you here. Their cardiogram their blood pressure, their oxygen concentration in their blood, and their temperature. And it won't be long, because it's technically feasible now, that you could check yourself. Any time when you check your email, you check the web, you could be checking your own vital signs. That's a little worrisome, I know. <laughs> well, we have a lot of wireless devices. They really got started in the fitness world, like the Nike Plus Shoe and wireless accel accelerometers that encourage people to be much more active, taking those 10,000 steps per day. How many of you have have seen or used the Zio clock alarm. That's interesting. This is a wireless device for sleep. It looks very innocent like an alarm clock, but underneath the time is your ZQ score for the night. And it tracks every minute of sleep what phase you're in, because it's a brainwave sensor that is a headband that you wear at night. And this is an example of a sleep uh, pattern I had one night. Uh, and you can see the, the orange bars are the awake time, the light gray is the, um, light, is the light sleep, which is not of much value. The light green is the uh, dream REM sleep, and the deep restorative sleep are the deep green. Now, I learned a very important thing about this, because uh, sometimes my wife, uh, Susan, who's here with us today, uh, she she's a night owl, she'll come to uh, bed late, and she'll look at the clock and she says, Eric, I know you're awake, and I want to talk. <laughs> so this is not just about sleep. Now, we talked about social networking. <laughs> this is an example of every metric, how you can share them with your friends or your peer group. And here is change, exchanging your ZQ score to all the people of the same age. And I did that, and I found that the reason I had a pretty well-preserved ZQ score was because I dream really well. And that, you can take that, everything I said today, in that context. <laughs> now, before wrapping up, just to say that there's lots of different 
uh, conditions that we can manage better with wireless sensors and ultimately prevent them by having genomic guided uh, in terms of using these sensors. So, for example, prevent the first asthma attack, prevent the very first uh, arrhythmia. And this is really exciting. We've also seen a challenge of the medical icon, the stethoscope. This stethoscope came about in 1816. It looked like this. It took 20 years for doctors to accept they should use a stethoscope. Not much has changed, unfortunately, over the years. And now we have a real stethoscope that we can actually uh, look at into the chest. And for cardiologists, this will quickly uh, uh, supplant the use of the stethoscope. It fits in the pocket, just like a stethoscope, and uh, it has images that are as good or better than the real Equilab in the hospital, and really doesn't cost anything once you have this in your pocket. It can be done in, in the middle of an exam, and someday people will have such very high-definition, high-resolution devices at their home to send this wireless to a caregiver to give them guidance about anything from a possible uh, mass or their heart or even their fetal um, uh, condition. So this is a really exciting step in imaging, and it's all part of this digital world. So we are now moving from Homo distractus to another new plane, Homo digitus. And it really has great promise that digitizing man, that is a much more precise, efficient use uh, of medicine by understanding the individual at the biologic, physiologic, anatomic basis, a panoramic view. Thanks very much for your attention.